put it in. Cool. All right. So, um, what a what a week to be doing a legal training. Um, yeah, nice to see everyone here. Uh, so, yeah, I'm here with um, with Aid uh, and Gail as well uh, for this Money Rebellion legal training. Uh, so, yeah, in this talk, we're going to be covering kind of two sections. Uh, the first bit is going to be about debt strikes and financial civil disobedience and all the stuff you could want to know about that. And that's going to be with, uh, with aid. And then for the second bit, I'm going to take you through uh, some of the on the streets actions. Um, I'm going to try and give you a very small update on, uh, on the anti-protest bill, but um, it's not going to focus massively on that. Uh, and you'll see why uh, when we get there. So uh, I'm just gonna share my screen and just give you a real brief update on what Money Rebellion is, uh, what some of our actions are, and yeah, why we're doing this. So, uh, oh. uh, if I can remember where slideshow is. Present, okay. All right, so. Yeah, so, uh, slide. So, yeah, so Money Rebellion, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an initiative within XR uh, to call out the economic system that's destroying life on this planet. Um, and you can learn more about it by getting a uh, Money Rebellion talk at your local group. Um, you can read our guides, which has a more in-depth look at all the actions that we're doing. And we've also got a, a quicker two-page summary um, that you can look at. Now, we're going to share the, uh, these slides uh, after this talk, so you can look at all this information in more detail. Uh, but yeah, this presentation isn't going into loads of detail on the actions themselves. It's looking at the legal implications of them. Um, so uh, non-payment of debt and tax. It's a new uh, kind of action we're taking forward um, because of the structural issues that things like debt create uh, drives growth in our economy, uh, which is one of the big reasons for um, uh, the climate and ecological crisis, um, the ever expanding uh, growth on a finite planet uh, that we're experiencing. Uh, our tax is used to worsen a climate and ecological emergency. It pays for stuff like HS2, bails out polluters, uh, subsidizes fossil fuels. We're the biggest uh, subsidizer of fossil fuels in Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's part of this breaking of the social contract um, that we're experiencing with our government. So <clears throat> some of the targets we've got you can kind of break them down into uh, public and private. So uh, you may have been part of some of the actions targeting Barclays and HSBC over the last few months. Um, and then uh, they're two of the biggest funders of fossil fuels in Europe, uh, got offices here in the UK, branches all over the place. Um, and then on the public level, uh, we've got some of the enablers of these banks. So the Bank of England uh, is supposed to be regulating these private banks, along with the Treasury, uh, the Prime Minister, um, and also you've got local government, which has a lot of money invested uh, for its pensions and banks, bank accounts in, uh, in destructive projects through fossil fuels uh, and, and nature destruction. Um, and yeah, uh, so those are, there are other institutions uh, like uh, BlackRock, uh, the Stock Exchange, think tanks, but mainly our actions so far have been focusing on uh, these private banks um, and the government. So, uh, so this first bit of the presentation is going to be about financial civil disobedience. So in other words, debt and tax strikes. And I'll just quickly take you through uh, a couple of uh, those actions. And then Ada is going to get into some of the detail on the, on the legalities. Um, so the first one that we've kind of got going at the moment is we're calling a repair the harm and it's targeting Barclays Bank. And basically what people are doing is uh, they're taking out a credit card or using an existing one uh, and they're borrowing uh, 
could be a small amount of money. Some people have taken out more uh, from the bank and they're donating uh, that the debt that they're taking out through that credit card to uh, frontline activists or organizations that are repairing, actively repairing the harm that Barclays is doing. Um, so for instance, some of those organizations are Survival International, uh, the Acacia School, and we're, do, we're saying we're doing that on behalf of Barclays uh, to repair the harm that they're doing through their, their fossil fuel and, and nature destroying investments. And we're challenging Barclays to write off the debt that we're incurring with them. Uh, on their behalf. Um, so Aid will go into a bit more of the details of that and what refusing payment really looks like. Uh, and we're doing this action in collaboration with uh, Animal Rebellion. And you can read the action brief uh, in the notes when we share these slides. The second action, uh, which we're hopefully gonna be launching soon, I think, uh, is called the Earth Tax Pledge. And uh, we've been calculating the percentage of our taxes that we spend on really destructive projects like uh, HS2, fossil fuel subsidies, uh, building new roads, um, things that we definitely don't want to be doing in a climate and ecological emergency. Uh, and in the same way, we're going to be withholding that tax, uh, putting it into an escrow account um, to fund uh, either a global citizens assembly or uh, another green project. Again, things that are actively fighting uh, the harm uh, mitigating that harm that our governments are using our taxes for. Uh, and this is also a, a tactic that can be used with your local council. Uh, if, for instance, your local council is funding, uh, uh, you know, a destructive project like an incinerator, um, you know, a coal mine, whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, part of some of these actions is condition, conditional commitment. So, uh, with, with certain actions, we aren't going to be having, uh, you're not going to be going it alone. You're going to be safe in the knowledge that hundreds or thousands of people uh, are going to be doing these actions with you. Um, some of them, like the repair the harm action, I've, I've already taken off. Uh, but yeah, others are going to um, have a conditional commitment. Uh, so we've got strength in numbers. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and these are some other actions we've got going on, but to be honest, uh, they don't really require, part, they're not part of this legal training because they don't have any big legal things attached, uh, like digital actions. Um, so yeah, so from there, I'm going to pass over to AIDS uh, for the financial civil disobedience bit of the presentation. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing, and AID, if you want to, if you want to share from your screen. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, let's just put the presentation up. Great. Um, thanks, Rob, and um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of the legal issues to consider um, from a money perspective. So Rob will talk a little bit later about the consequences of kind of on the streets action. I'm going to be talking about um, how to protect yourself, in essence, um, from um, an enforcement action that a creditor might take. And by creditor, I mean like the Barclays or um, like HMRC, if you're um, stopping paying tax. And the most important thing to say is um, that we're not regulated to give advice. So this is very much about tactics rather than advice. This is about helping people who wanna be involved understand what risks there are and how best they can protect themselves against those risks, to mitigate those risks. I think very importantly, um, everyone's circumstances are different, um, and therefore it can't be one approach to all, but we're gonna go through each of those actions that Rob outlined at the beginning and talk through what risks they might involve and how you can protect yourself as a rebel and therefore you can determine how far you want to go with a particular action. XR is here to support people. There's only so much I can get through in the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, and therefore um, we have a Telegram channel, Ask Aid, where we can take additional um, um, questions that you might have that are very specific to your circumstances. So this evening we're gonna be talking very much in the generality um, but everyone will have very specific questions about their own circumstances. So we're here with the Telegram channel. 
support those queries as they come in. Um, so if we kick off with um, the repair harm action. Um, so here, I think the important things to consider are there's two ways to do that. One is by taking out new credit, in particular, a new credit card. And the other is if you're an existing um, customer of one of the banks. I'll start off with existing customers. So um, I think because you don't have a need to apply for the loan or credit, uh, that means you're much less likely to face a accusation of fraud. Um, fraud's a criminal offence. It's outside our remit, um, certainly my knowledge, to talk about um, that particular um, uh, criminal action that might be taken, other than saying it's very rare um, when it comes to creditors, especially when it's a small amount that might be borrowed. It costs hundreds of pounds to, to instigate uh, Broad investigation, um, and so for you know the little the little um, withholding of of payments like twenty pounds here or even a little bit more is, is unlikely to happen. But also you know if you've got an existing credit card that you've been using a lot, um, then you know there is it's very hard to prove a fraudulent intent because you're just withholding part of that payment and, and making a donation um, as part of the repair harm action. I think the most important thing for people to consider is that if you are taking out um, a, a item of credit and you're not making a repayment on time, that will have an impact on your credit score. Now we will talk more about credit scores um, a little towards the end of my slot. Um, but you know, if you're thinking of re remortgaging or taking out a loan soon, then um, not paying that card will reduce your credit score and may make it harder for you to get that extra credit card or get that extra loan or, or get that mortgage. However, um, a reduction for missing a payment on a credit card um, might reduce your credit score by X number of points, but equally later on, we'll talk about what you can do to improve your credit score. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily a net loss, as it were. You might lose some points because you're not paying a credit card back, but then you could gain some points, for example, by making sure you're on the electoral register. Um, the other kind of scenario is where you're taking out a new credit card. Um, so it might be an accusation of fraud. So you took a credit card out, you had no intention of repaying, but it isn't really necessarily about none intention of repaying. It is about taking an action to highlight the climate damage that these financial institutions are um, taking. And, and again, we're not really here to go into the ins and outs of an accusation around fraud, um, but it's just to highlight that it, it it, it might be more likely that that accusation came forward if you were a brand new customer. But again, on the credit scoring issue, it can be hard to get one of these credit cards, especially from a high street bank. Um, so, you know, you need to have a high, pretty high credit score, maybe with Experian 900 and above, TransUnion above 650 maybe, so it can be quite hard. And we do know rebels have struggled um, to be able to get this line of credit to then rebel against. Again, what we'll do, we'll talk in a moment, uh, a few moments about what you can do to increase your credit score and improve the likelihood that you will be able to have access to this credit and participate. Um, just to say, I think what we did last time, we, we took questions in, in the chat and then we'll, we'll sort of take those maybe in, in chunks after my bit and then towards the end, but certainly towards the end. So if you do have any sort of questions, then throw them in the chat and, um, and then we, we, we can certainly bring, bring you in. Um, so um, let's just think about the worst case scenario. So the most important thing to remember is when it comes to enforcing a credit debt, from a bank or building society, or then the, it's not a criminal action to recover that money. It's a civil court action in the county court. And that kind of action is very, very rare, only because potentially if you've, you know, you've rebelled on a hundred pounds, it's gonna cost two or 300 pounds to take you to court court fees and the legal fees so it doesn't make any economic sense to do so even if you are taken to court this can be stopped 
Um, now, it will have no impact on um, your credit history if you repay their county court judgment within 30 days, it disappears from your credit file. But also, you can stop this by repaying the debt in full. And even if you were taken to court, there's a whole process to go through before they can do something like send a bailiff around to visit your house. And the most important thing when I use the word bailiff, I'm not talking about the, the kind of bailiff you might get on an HS2 action, uh, a bailiff involved in an eviction proceeding. These are county court bailiffs and their powers are very limited. They can't force their way into your home. They have to send you a warning note before they turn up. The bailiffs can't be used against vulnerable households. And that, that definition of vulnerability is drawn very widely. For example, includes lone parents. And um, so, you know, the worst case scenario with, with civil court, sorry, with, with a repair harm action in civil court, I think would be, would be very unlikely. You're more likely to have to go through a collection procedure. And that's really what, what, what this slide is, is all about. Um, so here you can see um, we've got a bit of a time frame. Um, so um, along the bottom, we've got days. So day three, day 14, day 28, up to day 60. This is when you can expect something to happen. Um, then we've got those in kind of little stages. And then we've got what action the creditor might take. And then what example tactics a rebel might take to respond to that. So we're talking creditors here. So this is not about tax. We'll come back on to tax next. This is about um, a credit arrangement with a bank or builder society or similar. So this is the action that they'll take. And this is all regulated. So we can be pretty certain that this is the process that will be followed. So the first thing that will happen, you know, around about day three, you've missed a payment, you get a call, you get a text about a missed payment um, or an email. And, you know, we'd suggest at this stage, potentially not really taking any action, keep things quiet, might be counterproductive if you then started writing back and saying, well, I'm taking part in this big action, because um, that might um, uh, take time away from getting a bit of a groundswell. Um, the next thing that's likely to happen if you don't make a payment, around two weeks in, you'll get a missed payment letter. So this, and um, this is also the point at which um, a missed payment would be recorded at a credit reference agency. Now, credit reference, it depends when a lender reports to a credit reference agency, but the earliest that's likely to take place is 40 days after missing the payment. Now here, again, you know, if you want to participate, use the Telegram channel. I haven't got really time to go through this now, but there's a thing called a notice of correction, which you can put on your credit file and creditors have to read it. So that might be something along the lines of a short note explaining like, look, I missed this payment, not because I couldn't pay, it's because I was taking part in this action. And then explaining a little bit more about that, bearing in mind there is a bit of a character limit to how much you can write. Um, around about day 28, sort of four weeks in, you get a default notice calling in the entire balance of the credit card or loan account or whatever that might be. Now, this isn't the same as a default being recorded at a credit reference agency. That's very distinctive. A default at a credit reference agency is typically when you've missed six months consecutive payments. This is just a default notice under the Consumer Credit Act. And it might be that your response is to send a strike letter um, to the creditor and maybe at a head office um, to draw attention to why you're taking this action. Then uh, probably around day 45, it's going to go into some sort of internal collections department at the bank. Still, still internal, still with the bank. Um, and here, again, there's a thing called the pre-action protocol for debt. So the idea is that creditors should avoid taking you to court, do everything they can to stop you ending up in civil court. And therefore, um, you know, sending a strike letter, but making sure that you're aware of the pre-action protocol for debt. In other words, you've got to negotiate rather than take legal action against me. Um, then around about day 60, um, the account's going to probably go to some extent external collection agency. Um, you might want to say that you're going to make a payment at day 90. And the reason I've said day 90 is day 90 is when the amount that you've not paid hits the bank or financial institutions bad debt provision. 
If you owed a bank a thousand pounds and didn't pay it for 90 days, the bank has literally got to take money from its profit and put it into a special account, in effect, writing off your debt internally in what's called their bad debt provision. So if you want to have an impact on a lender, it takes about 90 days for that to really hit their bottom line. Uh, now you might get a threat of county court action. But again, you might say, well, I'm going to pay in day 90, I'm going to pay in day 100, or just continue the strike action. Um, bearing in mind that provided there's a dialogue going on, it's very unlikely that you're going to end up in court, and you're very unlikely to end up in court because the amounts of money you're probably talking about are relatively small. So that's what it looks like um, from a kind of creditor's perspective. Um, by the creditor, I mean kind of, you know, a financial institution. Uh, we've then got this whole HMRC, so Her Majesty's Registry, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Uh, a little more serious. Um, again, so these are what you might call the highest priority debts. So these are ones that the government is obviously keen to enforce and will enforce. Ultimately, it could you could be called to magistrate's court for committing to prison, but that's very, very unlikely. I'll explain why in the next slide. It's also important to understand the difference between business debt and personal debt. And sometimes these, these, these lines can be blurred. So you might be a sole trader. In other words, you work for yourself, but not through a limited company. That's a personal debt, not a business debt. A business debt would be one where um, you've um, a business debt would be one where you're a director of a limited company, for example, and that limited company is not paying tax. And by tax, we're talking national insurance, we're talking VAT, we're talking income tax. Um, so again, you know, and the reason it's important to distinguish between business and personal is ultimately when it comes to like a bailiff enforcing action. The powers of the bailiff are far greater against a business than they are against an individual. An individual, again, you know, hard to enter your premises. A business, they can just break into your property and, and take your business goods. So it's, it's important to get that distinction um, between business and personal. There are also a bunch of sort of coronavirus, COVID-19 tactics that you could use to delay payment. Um, you can defer your VAT, for example, and, and some of your VAYE if you run a limited company. Um, but in most cases, I think we're probably talking about individuals withholding tax. That's obviously quite difficult um, if you earn and you're a paid employee because you don't really have any choice. Your, your tax is deducted at source. But certainly if you work for yourself, this is a, 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 good, a good option to take or work in a company where there's a, where's a group of you um, wanting to take a similar action. What would Her Majesty's Register of Revenue and Customs do? So this is their list of priorities, one, two, three, four. So the first thing they'll try and do is just recover it, recover any tax that's due through pay as you earn. In other words, they'll change your tax code. So your tax code might be 1220, which is don't tax me for anything under 12,200 pounds, and they just change your tax code to 900, which means tax me for anything less than £9,000. So you lose £3,000 of your personal allowance, which means you're paying more tax, which means you're paying off your tax debt. So that's the number one thing that HMRC will do. It's easy, it's straightforward, and it pretty much guarantees a repayment. Now, if you're a sole trader, that might be different. If you're a company, that might be different because you've sold the AYE, you might decide not to change your tax code. Um, there are consequences to doing that, but nevertheless, in most cases, it will just be recovered from VAYE. So it's quite, HMRC, not paying HMRC, it's quite difficult action in terms of getting some kind of response back. Although, if, obviously, if lots of people do it, it, it causes a bit of a administrative burden for HMRC. If they can't get it back from PAYE, they'll try and get it from your bank account, direct from your bank account. However, you need to owe more than a thousand pounds and you need to be more than five thousand pounds in credit in your current account where they'll take the money from. Um, so again, you know, um, we've 
people might be lucky to have more than five grand knocking around their current account at any time. Um, but generally speaking, again, that's not, not, not a particularly easy action for them to take. Um, they may take you to a magistrate's court with a 12 month order to pay. If you fail to pay over that 12 months, that's when you could be looking at a committal hearing. But again, unlike council tax, which I'll talk about shortly, the distance between not paying HMRC and then um, not paying HMRC and ending up in a committal hearing, and you might decide to use a committal hearing as a way of raising the profile of your action. It's a long time. It's a long time. And finally, ultimately, they could decide to make you bankrupt. You've got to owe more than £5,000. Um, so one of the areas that a lot of rebels have been looking at is, is council tax. Um, so this, this basically um, could be quite a popular and, and useful action. We could spend a whole half day going through tactics for council tax rebellion. So I'll give you an outline here, but there are a number of XR local groups looking at this. And we're more than happy to come to those groups and talk through specific tactics, because there's a whole load of tactics to think about here. Um, importantly, you can go to prison for non payment of council tax. Again, this could be avoided. But again, having a committal hearing is something that may attract the press. It's in magistrates court, not the civil court. Therefore, there'll be a reporter present. Um, and um, that could be an opportunity to raise profile. Now, I say this could be avoided because you can go and have your hearing, have your say, and then just whip out the money at the last minute and pay off the debt and you won't go to prison. Um, so, you know, it, it's avoidable right up to the last minute. Um, but again, you know, it's emphasizing that the bailiffs for government tax debts have greater power of entry if you are a business, if you're an individual, the power of entry of a bailiff is very low. So I'm just highlighting that because, of course, there is a version of council tax called business rates. But again, a, um, a, 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 a bailiff um, acting on behalf of an, uh, the court enforcing the debt against an individual um, is they, they can't use a bailiff with, with, with very high powers of entry. So what, what happens with council tax? And we do know some rebels that are already doing this at the liability order hearing. So the first thing that happens, if you don't pay your council tax in seven days, you get a letter saying, pay your council tax in seven days. If you haven't paid the council tax in seven days, you get what's called a liability order hearing. Now, usually, this is just procedural. You go in, we didn't even go in, you don't have to turn up. And usually a magistrate just rubber stamps a load of liability order hearings. Liability order hearings are basically saying, yeah, I do owe the council tax. I do owe the council this money. Cost you 50 quid. However, we do know some rebels that are turning up to the liability order hearing in order to raise awareness. It's a good opportunity um, to draw attention to any action you might be taking. And because council tax is, is um, a local tax, um, organised by your local council. If your local council is up to something you know, good, then it's a really good opportunity for, to put pressure locally as well as nationally. Now, again, you know, one of one of the tactics, and this has been used not 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 in XR. It's been used in a number of cases, um, and, and was used a lot prior to council tax. And that's this committal to prison with a hearing is is something where some rebels might want to get to, in the knowledge that um, they can stop going to prison at the last minute by paying the debt in full or go to prison. Trouble is, you go to prison for 30 days typically and you come out and you still owe the money. Um, so it's not like you know you pay your council tax off by spending some time inside. Um, so they'll look at the different uh, options. They might decide to send a bailiff around, but if the bailiff doesn't have any luck because they can't get into your property, they send them away. They might try and attach your earnings if you're working. Um, but they can't attach your earnings if you're not working. They might decide to go for what's called a charging order. That's where they try and put the debt as a kind of second mortgage on your property and then get that repaid in the future. They could push for bankruptcy, but you've got to owe more than a thousand pounds or go for committal to prison. 
So there are some groups and we're actively listening to this and 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 you know when when and kind of helping people with tactics on the telegram channel we're bringing in we're bringing in what what, what what's actually happening on on the street with the council tax with people with council tax re rebelling um um to understand how local councils are prioritizing this approach what, what seems to be happening at the moment is um people the council are using a bailiff and then quite quickly going to uh, committal hearing. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a jump. If you're on the attachment of earnings, you can also have an attachment of benefits if you're on benefits, but there's a maximum amount and benefits are protected. So again, you know, there are lots of ways of um, avoiding um, <clears throat> these consequences, either by paying off in full um, or getting a committal hearing if, if, that, if that's the ultimate objective. Um, now, one last thing on council tax, and again, I said, you know, if people want to talk about council tax rebellion, we can go to local groups and talk it through and talk tactics. Um, everybody who's liable for council tax in your home would would be subject to this process. It's not like I'm aid and all the other people in my house, I'm the rebel, everyone else is fine. It doesn't work like that. Um, so you need, you know, you need you need to carry your household with you. Everyone who's liable for council tax in the household. Um, so you know, to kind of round off, I talked a lot about credit scores. We need a good credit score to get a loan from a high street bank. Equally, if we don't pay that loan back, um it's 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 going to impact um our it's going to impact um on 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 the credit score as well i've noticed by the way i've noticed a couple of questions coming on our chat I'll, I'll just finish this section off because i'm nearly at the end and then just go back on a couple of those questions before handing back to rob um so there are three different credit reference agencies and they use three different credit scores but it's not particularly helpful transunion experian and equifax um, they're not the only factor that's used to decide whether you get a loan. There are other things like affordability. Um, credit scores change monthly. And it's, you know, there are thousands of different variables in a credit scoring system. But I'm going to highlight a handful that drive your score up and a handful that drive your score down. In some cases, they're two sides of the same coin. Um, so, um, what drives a credit score up? So paying everything on time. So even if so it might be that um, you've decided not to pay that Barclay card back on time, but if everything else is being paid back on time, then that's positive. It might even be that you take a Barclay card out and you decide to take another credit card out and just pay that one on time, but keep the Barclays late. So, you know, paying everything on time is helpful, but, but it's also helpful to pay almost everything on time as well. That's better than paying nothing, not on time. And the other is, is having a lot of accounts. So, you know, having one credit card is, is, is okay. Um, having lots of credit cards is even better. Um, so having lots of accounts and by accounts, gas, electricity, mobile phones, Generally, these also report to a credit reference agency, so they can also have an impact. Uh, getting on the electoral roll, and obviously you've got rolling registration, lots of people drop out the electoral roll, but being on the electoral roll is really helpful. I think you'll also find you're not gonna get a Barclay card if you're not on the electoral roll. You're gonna need to be on the electoral roll to get a, get a prime credit card. Um, and then, I think, oops, I'll just click. Um, and then only using some of the credit. So this is probably the best way to get your credit score up is if you've got a credit card and you've got a thousand pound limit on your credit card, but you're only using a hundred pounds, that's brilliant and really good for your credit score. A lot better than having a thousand pound limit and being 990 pounds um, used of that limit. Um, and the other thing is just longevity, how long you've been in one place. Don't move home. That really helps your credit score. Credit is like, like stability. Um, so what can drive a credit score down? So obviously missing payments. These county court judgments can drive the credit score down. But if you pay the county court judgment off within 30 days, it won't have an impact. Having just taken out a loan can drive your score down because um, there's no proof that you can actually repay it. So if you took a loan out in January, your credit score is not, your payment's not due till February. Between those times, your credit score will actually go down by a good, could, could be 100 points. 
Um, as I said, sort of being at your credit card limits is has a has a real impact as, as well. Um, it could be very negative. But also what credit reference agencies do is they look at individual limits, they also look at the totality of your credit limits. So it might be that you've got one card that's at its limit, but another card is right, right down, not nowhere near its limit. So that, that can help as well. In other words, you might have a card, but you take a brand new card out with nothing on nothing on the balance, um, and you've got a thousand pound limit, and you don't use it at all. That's going to help your credit score. Uh, being made bankrupt is is pretty much um, hit a blow to your, to your credit score. So that's that's kind of an end to, to my section, really. Kind of a bit of a, a, a rough and ready overview of of um, of, of credit. Creditors and what action they can take, HMRC debt, um, and then a little bit more about the council tax stuff and driving schools up and down. And I think there's a link for the Telegram chat if people want to delve into the specifics. Thanks, um, Aids. Do you want to just stop your screen share for a moment? Thank yeah. you. Um, I'll give you a chance to look in the chat channel about the questions that came in. There's a couple that I think sit very squarely in, in, in kind of your uh, skill set, uh, one about pensions and one about fines regarding HMRC. And while you're just digesting those, <clears throat> I'll just pick up a couple of the other ones. Um, <clears throat> so there's a question early on asking if we're just tar targeting Barclays so that we can build up the numbers. Um, we, we are at the minute, um, and it's more a capacity issue on the Money Rebellion team that if we wanted to target an obvious target would be HMRC. Um, we would want somebody else to come and join our team and support us to get that um, action going. Given that we've already designed it for Barclays, it wouldn't be hard to, to do a similar design for HMRC, but it's getting the kind of letters together and so on. So if anybody is keen to do a different bank, um, do be in touch with us at Money Rebellion, and uh, but you'd need to do some of the work on that one. Um, and then similarly, uh, Nat in Cornwall was asking that if people pay their debts off at the end, are we not just simply actually supporting Barclays Bank, you know, by uh, being customers of theirs and then ultimately paying off the, the debts? Um, it's an interesting question. I think the point, first of all, to say, and I'm participating in one of these actions, is I really haven't made a decision about whether I would pay anything off or not at the minute. I, I don't think I'm going to. So. Um, I, I think it's really a question of being on a journey and deciding whenever. Um, if it's a small amount of money that you've um, taken out with them, bear in mind that sort of letters are coming in through the post and that there's a certain amount of admin that they have to pay. So their business model will be based on making profits from some customers and not all customers are profitable. So that if we're, you know, creating some um, admin uh, and costs for them, then it's not necessarily that we are giving them any kind of profit. Um, I don't have a way of doing the calculations on that. The, I think the main thing to say, one of the things that is most valuable to any consumer facing organization is their reputation, uh, both externally to potential customers and, and their current customers and to their staff, and that affects staff morale. So this targeting that we do has, has a, an impact on uh, Barclays at, at many levels. So yeah, I just, um, it's hard to quantify these things. So we're just in, like innovating really. Um, so uh, yeah, and um, I, I, certainly uh, on the streets actions, which Rob can talk more about, it's ready to press ahead with HMRC. Um, there was another one that was asking about council taxes as to whether um, you know you might withhold council tax until they agree to do a citizens assembly that's exactly the kind of thing that we've got in mind here um, and you know with any kind of actions uh, targeting councils or many of these there are sort of different waves so there can be a single person who goes ahead and takes quite a high risk and high sacrifice um, and this publicity comes off the back of that um, they might be followed in by other people joining the action or supporting them by protecting them from the bailiffs or protesting about the council. So it's all there's a lot here that's beyond legal and financial tactics. It's about, you know, action uh, tactics and what the appetite is locally. So um, I'll just hand back to to A to answer those um, 
uh, questions that were more financial and legal focused. Thanks, thanks, Gail. Um, so I've got there's two questions here really. One is about deductions. So um, when, when, for example, with the council tax debt, what, how deductions can be taken from your benefits or pension, the only um, income that can be deducted by the government, by the Department of Work and Pensions, through what's called the third party deduction scheme, is income support, job seekers allowance, pension credit, but not the state pension, but pension credit, um, employment support allowance and universal credit. So income support, JSA, pension credit, ESA and universal credit. Now, there's a maximum amount of deductions that can be taken. So if there are deductions for rent arrears or, or water arrears or something, um, then um, there's only so much could, could be taken. In addition, um, there's an order and council tax is a little bit down, down the pecking order. Um, so there are like 11 things that can be deducted and council tax is number seven. Um, so council tax is behind mortgage arrears, housing arrears, rent arrears, gas, electricity or water charges. So it's some way down, down the list. So that's how deductions work. The other question that um, came in um, was about HMRC and, and fines and imprisonment. Um, it all depends on what kind of HMRC debt there is. Probably the debt with the greatest consequence is value added tax, VAT. Um, you're much more likely to be fined. You're much more likely to end up in magistrate's court for non-payment. Um, however, when it comes to something like income tax and withholding income tax, um, then um, the, the main consequence is interest that's paid. Um, so as I said earlier, they'll, they'll, HMRC will look at the enforcement options and kind of a, a, um, a, a magistrate's court hearing is, is way down their list of priorities. And then, you, then it's an order and you've got 12 months to pay it back. Um, so the biggest kind of consequence, if you like, from not paying HMRC is, is, is going to be interest um, payable on a, on a daily basis. And the other thing, just to finish that, to, to, to kind of tie things together a little bit, um, HMRC does not report to a credit reference agency. So if you don't pay a government department, including council tax, if you don't pay a tax back, it won't be reported to a credit reference agency. I think there were the two, two questions that I picked up. Um, thanks, Aid. That's really helpful. I just a couple more came in that were still on the sort of tactical side of things. So Nat was asking more about the fact that we could be doing these in an open-ended way. Um, you know, like if you went on a hunger strike, it's good to decide like, when you're stopping. Although I have to say, people that I know that have done hunger strikes, um, I've spoken to them, they haven't made that decision. It is part of an ongoing process where, where they decide based on how they're feeling and what the response is. Uh, a lot of this is about getting publicity for a cause. So it's a little bit like turning up to a protest and sitting in a road and sometimes it's not fully clear and you, you make those decisions together. So those of us that are doing the repair harm action, we are in, um, in, a, in a group together in the Telegram group with others that are interested in the action and we're just, you know, communicating with each other about what's happening. It seems relatively minor at the minute. Um, I mean, one of us, not me, took out a loan for three and a half thousand pounds, so that's more significant because they, they got a high credit, um, you know, amount of credit. Those of us that have done a, a board around fifty pounds, I think we are getting a charge of twelve pounds four times in the year, and then plus some interest charges. It's not particularly feeling onerous. Obviously, that's going to depend on individual circumstances. Um, so uh, the point here is to, to see how this thing grows, see if more people join us, see if Barclays communicate with us. So it, it is entering unknown territory. I, 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 it's hard to have this thing fully designed up front because you just don't know um, what's going to happen. Um, so, there's, so there's more letters that we can write, more press release, and we can do more social media, that sort of thing. Um, just going back to the sort of council tax question that people were asking, how much of council tax is spent on dodgy project, projects? 
Um, well, I guess it, first of all, to say it depends whether you're using the non-payment of council tax in a punitive way because your council's making awful decisions and they need to make better decisions. Um, the amount of revenue any one organisation makes is going to go up and down and we'll have ways to, to, to manage that. Um, so I, I think it's much more about saying that, you know, we're in an emergency and they have to do something better or, or, or stop doing a thing. In some cases, yes, um, they are spending a lot of money on, on projects. It depends. Um, uh, or, or they're actually subsidising projects by giving people, act, you know, giving people the go ahead to say do a coal mine. It's just, it's it, 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 they're, they're creating the sort of social, not the social license. They're creating the local licences. Uh, in in Stroud in Gloucestershire, for example, I've paid council tax to Stroud, but eighty percent of it goes on to Gloucestershire County Council, and they funded with that an incinerator. It's kind of like um. A, a, a really hideous um, scheme that's cost ridiculous amounts of money. Let's say anyway. So I guess it depends on the particular um, the particular council and, and why people might do this. But that's all part of having a group conversation, isn't it, about specific councils and what they are and aren't doing. Um, I, I think now uh, there's other things coming in the chat, but I think we'll just move over to Rob to talk more about on the streets thing, and we'll carry on processing. Uh, the other actions. So over to Rob. Super. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, do stick around if you still got those questions for Aid, because we will be answering all, all kinds of questions at the end. Um, all right. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, yeah, so as it says on the streets actions, it's more like the classic kind of exile actions that you'll be used to. Um, but yeah, we would just want to be comprehensive and uh, go for everything. So uh, starting from like least spicy uh, to most, these are some of the actions we're doing at the moment. Obviously, yours may be different. Um, but yeah, you know, go to branches, do stuff there. Uh, you know, you can cut up your card, take over a queue, uh, have a crime scene action. But when it actually starts to get spicy, uh, so we see tactic 12 here, uh, sticking uh, stickers on ATM. Some of you may have done this over the last few months. Uh, uh, occupying a branch, uh, splashing liquid over something, uh, shutting down a branch, um, you know, by blocking it somehow, super glue in the lock, something like that. These are all gonna incur uh, civil or criminal um, charges potentially. So that's what we're gonna go through. Not gonna go through every last possible one, but we're gonna look at the most likely ones um yeah and see what the consequences could be so uh starting with yeah at least least kind of uh spicy i suppose civil offenses so yeah in case you don't know what a civil offense is uh it's different to a criminal offense you can't you, the police don't have the power to arrest you for a civil offense um and uh it's about a dispute between an in, in, uh, individuals uh, or organizations and it's usually about uh, getting compensation uh, for something. Uh, so you won't get sent to prison for it, uh, but you could lose some money. So the first kind of common one that, that could happen uh, is called private nuisance. So that's basically where you're interfering with uh, someone's enjoyment of, uh, of their land, basically. So you don't have to actually be on the land, uh, but you could be, you know, uh, banging some drums, uh, letting off uh, a smoke flare, um, you know, spilling some oil over their doorway, something like that something that's um annoying them basically uh so yeah uh the requirements are you've got to be continuously doing this uh over a period of time uh it's got to be unreasonable um and yeah it's got to, it's got to interfere with their enjoyment uh, or or some other rights they have over it so yeah things like obstructing it occupying it doing die-ins playing loud music making loud noises these are all things that could get you private nuisance uh, and the consequences uh, yeah you could have to pay damages uh, depending on you know that for instance if you're at a bank uh, they might say they've lost some income uh, they could try get an injunction against you uh, if uh, they're really annoyed at you um, and they can take some kind of reasonable measure to uh, to stop you doing it um, whatever that might be uh, yeah and the courts can take a very like wide discretion over what uh, 
what those consequences might be. Obviously, as you can imagine, private nuisance uh, can encompass all kinds of things, but point is, it's taken by uh, the, uh, the bank or the manager or the person whose who's property you're infringing upon. Um, so the next one is trespass. Uh, so this is, yeah, you're entering or you're putting property on, uh, like a you know tripod or a tent or something, on land that belongs to someone else without permission. Now, uh, if you've got implied permission to enter somewhere, like a bank, uh, then you're not committing trespass until they've asked you to leave um, and you haven't done so. And I think this is one of the ones that the new crime bill is trying to make a criminal offence instead of a civil offence. And we'll look at that what that means a bit later. So, um, yeah, so basically you were abusing an existing right to be on someone else's land. And so that could, again, be obstructing someone's private property, occupying it, uh, erecting structures on it. If you're locking on or gluing uh, gluing on to, to uh, a building, that could incur trespass. And it's similar to a uh, private nuisance in that you can get uh, damages taken out. You know, you could have made them lose business. Um, they can get an injunction taken out against you uh, and they can take reasonable, reasonable measures to, uh, you know, remove you from the premises. And I think they can also they can also ask the police to remove you, even if they're not going to arrest you for that trespass or uh, send you to prison for it. Um, so yeah, so th those are the two main civil ones that you might be looking at here uh, for doing the, the kind of actions that you might be doing with, with Money Rebellion. Um, yeah, which as I say, at the moment are mainly involving banks or government buildings. Um, so the second section uh, or category is criminal offences. So, uh, so here you're, instead of going to civil court, uh, you're going to be, uh, the case is going to be brought by the Crown Prosecution Service in this case. Uh, and you can go to either a magistrate's court uh, or crown court, uh, and that will depend on the nature of the offence. Uh, you've got to be proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Um, so, you know, the prosecution has to prove that you actually did this. Uh, and yeah, you could get fines, you could get prison sentences, community service, uh, those, those kinds of penalties. Um, so, yeah, starting again at kind of... I suppose a low level, but this is quite a broad one actually. Uh, and again, it's the one it's one that could be affected by the crime, the, the anti-protest bill. Uh, so public nuisance, um, yeah, you incur an injury loss uh, or damage to the public generally rather than a specific individual. So that's what differentiates it from private nuisance. Um, so really, really broad. Uh, so just I guess as an example. Uh, I was charged with public nuisance for uh, obstructing the road outside um, uh, London City Airport uh, in 2019. Um, yeah, and I had to ended up having to pay a £70 fine after pleading uh, guilty for that. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, as I say, like in practice, uh, you know, things like blocking a road. Uh, major roads, uh, that's the kind of thing that could lead to a public nuisance charge. Um, and just like with, with private nuisance or, uh, or trespass, like abusing your, your right to be on that land in some way, um, or after permission has expired, so obstruction, occupying, but could again be loud music, uh, or just, you know, generally stuff that is annoying people in some way. Um, so depending on what you've done and how how kind of serious and spicy it is. Uh, you could get a fine uh, in magistrate's court. Uh, you could have a six month prison sentence. Um, you know, it's not, it's not massively likely for the kind of, kind of bank actions you might be doing uh, for the first time at least. Um, and yeah, one thing to say about the fines, because that's one of the things that puts people off doing this kind of thing, they're means tested. Uh, so, they're not usually meant to kind of make you uh, destitute from the fine that you get. Uh, so it's based, it's usually based on like a percentage of your weekly income. Um, yeah, so that's how they calculate it. And, and if you can kind of prove that, uh, you know, you're not a person of means, uh, you can uh, work out a payment plan um, with, the, with the judges uh, or the magistrates um, to pay that off over a certain period. Uh, yeah, if you go Crown Court, could be prison time. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, for for most of the kind of things we're doing, it's not super likely. Um, 
okay, next one. So this applies to like, you know, the sticker actions, putting posts on stuff. It's pretty obvious what it is. Fly posting, you're attaching, uh, you know, adverts, promotional material to basically anything uh, without permission. So uh, yeah, you know, if you're putting in a bus stop, uh, that could be a, a fly posting uh, uh, fence. Um, and yeah, again, it's like, it's fine to it. So, uh, on the spot fine up to 80 pounds, you can get another type of fine called a fixed, fixed penalty notice. Um, and once you go to court, they can also give you a fine depending on, you know, uh, <clears throat> how serious it is up to 2,500 pounds <clears throat> plus 250 for each day that you continue doing it. Um, and yeah, there's some other measures they can take there. Uh, yeah, and so one thing to take into account when you're like sticking stuff to something, anytime you're doing something like that, you could also get, uh, you, you've got to be basically be prepared to get a criminal damage charge, uh, which takes us on the, like to the next bit. So even if you think you're not doing like actual physical damage to something, you could still be up for a uh, physical damage charge. So yeah, again, to like give you an anecdote, uh, like uh, last year, uh, I sprayed a, a fire extinguisher full of oil on Barclays HQ in Canary Wharf. Uh, and like, you know, it was just sprayed on glass. It didn't actually damage anything. Uh, it's probably it's like all water soluble and probably not very hard to like clean off. But the charge uh, that was was made against me was criminal damage because uh, they did have to actually remove it. So, um, so yeah, you know, ch even chalk spray, fly posting, taping doors shut. If you climb on stuff, you know, you could get a criminal damage charge potentially. Um, and basically the way they divide this is on the cost of the damage. So if it's below 5,000 pounds, generally it will go to magistrate's court. Uh, and yeah, so there's like what are varying, like starting to maximum sentences there. Uh, but usually it's gonna be, I guess, at least for a first time offense, it's gonna be a fine. Um, could be a conditional and uh, conditional discharge um, and so what that means is paying for the cleaning for for the removal what it costs uh, to remove um, you know whatever you know liquid or posters or whatever you you put on there um, but yeah in a in a really serious case could go up to three months uh, prison sentence but you know it's not I don't think that's that's happened to many people in XR um not sure if that's, if it's happened to anyone that i know of. um uh yeah and then over five thousand pounds for criminal damage uh you could go to crown court and that's where instead of magistrates uh you're going to be in front of a jury um and a judge so yeah obviously because the cost of the damage is more what you have to pay in a fine could also be more uh you know it's gonna be over five thousand pounds so I, th I think like, for instance, I think Roger Hallam did that, like uh, to like, mm, you know, at, at King's College to get into Crown Court by deliberately doing a certain amount of damage that, you know, had to be uh, uh, in Crown Court. I think I'm right about that. Um, so, you know, that can be an advantage because then you're in front of a jury, uh, you get to plead your case a bit more maybe. Uh, and yeah, maybe you're more likely to get low off. Um, I guess just anecdotally for when I did this, uh, I did actually get found not guilty. Um, and, but that was just basically because the prosecution didn't bring any evidence. So yeah, um, just an anecdote there. Uh, so next one, aggravated trespass. So unlike trespass, which is civil offense, this is criminal offense. Um, so you're trespassing on land, uh, but you're also obstructing or disrupting lawful activity or intimidating people uh, to stop them from engaging in something. You know, could be stopping, stopping Barclays going about their business, um, for instance. So, yeah, obstructing private land, occupying it, blocking entry, uh, locking, gluing on, uh, anything like that that might stop people going about their business, uh, being seen as, as intimidating them. Uh, yeah, so the starting point uh, is a fine again, uh, conditional discharge, suspended sentence. Um, and then the maximum again is three months, uh, three months in prison, thousand five, up to £2,500 fine. Um, but yeah, like first time you do this, 
that's pretty unlikely that maximum sentence. Um, okay, yeah, so one which we've added to this uh, recently, I think a few rebels have been charged with this thing called joint enterprise. So basically, if you work together with someone on an action, uh, and even if you uh, didn't necessarily do uh, the crime it, itself, if you were part of the, uh, if you're working together with the person who was doing that in some kind of way, if you're planning it, uh, helping them, uh, you could get charged with that same with that same crime. Um, yeah, it hasn't actually happened to to many people in XR, especially for like uh, money rebellion actions that I'm aware of, but it has happened to a few people. Um, but to be honest, I need to get more details on exactly what those actions were. Um, but yeah, something to be aware of could happen if you're, you know, found with a bunch of people to be doing this, uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, offences that we looked at. So um, yeah, I guess another anecdote, when I did that, uh, that oil spraying, one of the stupid mistakes I made was to put a list in my pocket of all the people who I had to go to their house before the action to pick up stuff. And luckily I didn't write their surnames or addresses on, on anything, but you know, the police like picked that up, ran it through a database, uh, kind of stressed me out while I was while I was in the van uh, and they were doing this, but you know, nothing came of it. So just something to be aware of, you know, empty your pockets. Uh, if you don't want other people to be uh, charged, you know, make it clear that you're the one doing this. Um, so yeah, lastly, uh, I just wanted to touch on, now I'm definitely not the expert on this, but just some of the ways these offences we looked at could change under the new uh, like anti-protest bill. Um, so just to briefly run through these points, uh, police have new powers to, uh, th this, this bill would give police new powers to um, uh, impose restrictions on static protests, which they don't currently have and, and only apply to like moving protests. Um, the impact of disruption uh, and noise, uh, I believe can get a protest, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, not injunctions, but uh, conditions, can get conditions put on them uh, if, if the noise is seen to kind of impact or disrupt basically anyone in, in almost any way. It's a very broad description. Um, secondary legislation, this allows Secretary of, State, Se Secretary of State Priti Patel to basically update uh, the new, uh, the bill uh, after it's been passed with things that she thinks should be on there without the prop, like the usual scrutiny that kind of primary legislation would go uh, would, would go through. So, so that's quite a scary one actually. Um, uh, knowledge of police imposed conditions. This is where you have to have like a um, uh, reasonable knowledge that a condition was in place uh, instead of like fully fully knowing it kind of thing. Um, so it's basically easier for police to um, to pull you up on, on breaching conditions, uh, like a section 14 that might be in place. Um, so yeah, there's increased sentences, uh, fines for organizers and attendees who don't comply with uh, police imposed conditions. Um, I think they increased by uh, quite a lot, I think by like 200, 260%. Uh, for, for some of the sentences. Um, uh, yeah, there's something about Parliament. They're trying to expand the area that you you can't obstruct around Parliament. Um, there's some more penalties, I think, in, for that. Uh, public nuisance. So that's one of the ones we looked at. Uh, they're increasing, they're trying to increase the maximum sentence of that to 10 years, um, which obviously sounds really serious. Uh, who knows like who would get that maximum sentence for the kind of things we'd be doing but yeah uh, that's just something to be aware of uh criminal damage the new bit in the in the anti-protest bill this applies specifically to memorials but the definition of memorials is very broad uh as they've written it in this in this bill and yeah they've increased uh the sentence uh, i think it was three months in the maximum sentence for, uh, for criminal damage, it's increased to 10 years uh, under this one. So 
Um, and then the other thing is they want to make trespass a criminal offence rather than a civil offence. So police could arrest you for trespass, uh, which they can't do at the moment. So yeah, um, as I say, I'm not the expert on that, but I thought it'd be, you know, it's obviously important to be thinking about these things. Um, I've linked in uh, uh, in on this slide, which I'll, I'll share these slides in the, in the chat, um, uh, the report from Liberty, which goes into more details on this. It's not too long. You can just dig into the details a bit more. Uh, and I guess, yeah, the thing to say about the bill is uh, it's gone through, uh, I think, a second reading uh, on uh, yesterday, I think. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's passed yet. Uh, it does mean it's very, very likely to pass. But basically, it's going to, I think it's going to committee now. And that means that uh, amendments uh, to the bill, that's where the kind of battleground is uh, for whether this goes through as it is or things get taken out or changed. Um, I, I believe, right, don't quote me on this, but I think it goes from committee to the Lords and then back to the House of Commons for like potentially uh, finally passing. Um, but yeah, you know, as it stands with the big Tory majority, it's, it's going to pass in some form, most likely. Uh, yeah, so finally, I just want to take you through a few other costs that you could incur. So if you plead guilty, um, uh, sorry, if you plead not guilty and you're found guilty at trial, uh, you could have to pay prosecution costs. And more commonly, these are a couple hundred pounds maybe, but very rarely they could go all the way up to uh, a grand. That's, that's very rare, but it's something to be aware of because that's something that can affect whether you, whether you plead uh, guilty or not guilty at your hearing. Um, yeah, I mean, your, your solicitor will go through all this stuff with you, but it's, it's good to know beforehand. Um, and the other thing is defence costs. Uh, if you qualify for legal aid, um, then you can, the, the state can pay for your, for your legal costs. Uh, I think the disposable income for this is, is usually £8,000, but it depends on a few different factors, like your family situation, uh, the legal aid board has to has to say that your case actually qualifies for it. So that's another thing to consider. Um, so yeah, just finally, just kind of taking you through what could generally happen when you get arrested. Uh, you get arrested at the scene, uh, transport to police station, you get processed at the police station, they take your, your fingerprint DNA, some personal details, um, and then you can be held for up to 24 hours uh, at the police station. Uh, they could interview you, they don't always do that, and then you get, uh, you're, you're allowed to have uh, legal advice, um, uh, you shouldn't accept the duty solicitor, you should have, a, have your own solicitor from somewhere like Bynman's or um, another, another kind of trusted uh, legal firm, uh, and then you get released, could be with bail conditions, uh, for instance, when I did that uh, Canary Wharf um, oil spraying action, I was not allowed to uh, return to Canary Wharf uh, until after my trial date. So yeah, they could they could ask you not to return to the the place of the of the offence. Um, uh, yeah, then you'll get in the mail. You'll get uh, a letter with your court date, uh, with any evidence or statements from um, from witnesses. Uh, uh, You'll talk through the case with your solicitors up to the hearing um, and then at the hearing you plead not guilty or guilty or not guilty uh, if you plead guilty that's you just get this, the sentence right there uh, and if you plead guilty uh, usually you get whatever um, uh, fine or sentence it, it usually get commuted by a third so let's say like you got a um, uh, a fine of 90 pounds, it could be commuted to 60 pounds uh, if you plead guilty uh, straight up at your hearing. If you plead not guilty, as we said before, you go to uh, uh, Crown or um, uh, Magistrates Court uh, with a trial, and then you get found guilty or not guilty. And um, yeah, you'll, you'll serve some of those consequences if you get found guilty that we looked at earlier. Um, yeah, so obviously we cover quite a lot here. And we've got really comprehensive documents with all the information in more detail uh, linked on this slide uh, for both on the streets and debt strike actions. Um, and yeah, just a final thing to say is like, uh, if that hasn't all put you off, please come and get involved. Um, the, 
apart from the ongoing uh, debt strikes on April 1st, uh, we are doing what we're calling a global money rebellion. So uh, not just the UK, but uh, several other countries are taking action at their local fossil banks. So for us, that's Barclays and HSBC. Um, and they're going to be doing all sorts of things. Uh, but yeah, you know, oil spills uh, could be some super gluing. Whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you guys want to be doing, uh, please do come and get involved. Um, and going into the future, uh, you can hear about all our actions, either through just the general, um, a lot of them come through the Rebellion broadcast, but you can also join the uh, uh, banking on breakdown telegram broadcast where we broadcast all our actions um, and you can also join uh, the repair the harm channel uh, and what else and there's a few links here so uh, if you want to get more involved in some of these actions you can sign an action network form uh, and we'll we'll get in touch with you uh, we've got a guide with more info on all of our uh, actions um, and examples and uh, yeah, just more, more detail. Um, yeah, and finally, you can request a Money Rebellion talk, uh, which goes into kind of some of the theory behind uh, Money Rebellion and what we're doing uh, into finance, economics, uh, and how those intersect with the climate and ecological crisis. Um, so yeah, I believe that's the last slide. Yes, okay, so um, we'll have questions now uh, on any of what we've uh, covered today. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. Thanks, um, Rob, thank you so much. And thanks to Aid as well for putting all that information together. Um, really appreciate it. I just tracked a few additional questions. So Aid, if you're there as well, because um, you, you might have more information on this. Um, I think Rod was asking about fines. So this is more um, not to do with debts. This is to do with um, getting found guilty and being fined. Uh, you said they took into account your means, Rob, and Rod, Rod was asking whether they took savings into account, which I think they do actually. They do ask for that information. Um, Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And um, I think Gail's right. I think they do take savings into account. And, um, but I believe uh, the fines are at least partly um, uh, based on a percentage of your weekly income. So they grade it into like a uh, band A, B, C, D and so on fines. And so like A is the, is the lowest uh, level. And yeah, it will depend on, um, a few different things. For instance, if it's not your first offence, you could be bumped up a level to like grade B fine, uh, or you know, if the offence is more serious, uh, you could get a higher fine. But yeah, uh, part of that fine is based on based on the percentage of your weekly income. So that does that does matter. Um, and also for legal aids, I think they'll consider those uh, those savings as well. Thanks, Rob. Um, I, there was a, a sort of fun and cheeky comment in the chat about remember the 11th commandment don't get caught uh what did say really uh, the, <laughs> the principles and values of extinction rebellion are that we do actions above the ground so we do get caught <laughs> we, it's part of our accountability um and it's part of our non-violence is to um be available to be accountable for what we've done I mean, we've never meant an, every single sticker that anybody might apply somewhere that no one's going to stand next to a sticker. So there's a sort of reasonableness there. But, you know, um, other forms of um, uh, damage and so on that people might do. I mean, some people have broken windows, for example. Uh, so, I mean, we're not here to judge if anybody wants to do any of these things under cover of night and, and run off. Like, that's entirely... Uh, up to you and I certainly uh, wouldn't have a problem with it but it wouldn't be an extinction rebellion action then it wouldn't fit to our principles and values. Um, it's also just worth mentioning in terms of the legal aid points that Rob was making that we do have um, a pop called the crowd justice pop um, which is if people need access to um, a solicitor um, that's available. I mean so much of what happens is, is quite standard and there's already information out there about what's going to happen but if people are feeling that need um 
somebody was talking about uh, police interviews um, and having answered the questions really well and <laughs> letting, given their phone. There's lots of really great information in descent.info that's just worth knowing about. Maybe you can just put that in the chat channel, Rob, um, that, that link. It's in the toolkit anyway. Um, what it's like if you've never been arrested before, what it's like. It's just like a process of bureaucracy for some people. It can be um, dark night, the soul sitting in the cell thinking about why we've got to this stage, that this is what we feel we have to do. For some people it can be an inconvenience, for some people it can be more worrying because maybe, you know, they realise their mental health was not up for it. Um, some people who are from racially marginalised communities might be treated differently. So all oh, these things should be taken into consideration before you do any of these things. For myself, I've quite enjoyed the peace and quiet for a few hours and no phone and done a bit of yoga. But, you know, that's speaking from a privileged position. Um, uh, I do feel free to add anything. Um, uh, Ada or Rob to any of this. I, I, I mean, I suppose the last thing, well, I'll just check actually, just check there's no more questions or Ada or Rob haven't got anything else they want to say. Um, just br bring a book to your, uh, if, you, if you get arrested. When I got arrested last year, the only book in the, um, uh, the police station was Jeremy Clarkson's autobiography. So um, <laughs> I didn't really want to read that. So yeah. <laughs> I I've always have a bag with me with several in. Um, make sure you've got no soft drugs on you or anything like that. I mean, it's sort of obvious that some people forget. Um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe just to finish by remembering uh, why we're here and the state of the situation in the world, um, the fact that of this bill is testimony to the fact that this kind of protest works. It has effect, but you can't know that your action's definitely gonna work. So there's something here of choosing to be your own hero, if that feels right, if that's part of your life story. Um, the banks, since the Paris Agreement, have spent 2.7 trillion uh, dollars on financing fossil fuels um, and other forms of biodiversity destruction much of it from Barclays Bank and HSBC and others. Um, and the latest climate science says that we are, the Paris Agreement's finished in terms of we're, we're not, we can't stay at one and a half degrees C, we're heading for two. And I believe there's gonna be some IPCC information coming out this year that's gonna be pretty awful. So um, we all have the rights we do because our ancestors have taken these kinds of actions and actually in the UK, relatively speaking, and depending on various personal circumstances, the risks are smaller than other countries where two to 300 environmental protesters get killed every year, you know, so it's all putting this into context really. And it's all um, a personal choice. So um, whatever you do, make sure you've got lots of support and you go through whatever process you need to make your decision. Um, this uh, has been recorded and um, we hope to make it available soon uh, in various Money Rebellion channels. So um, without, if there's no other questions, I just thank you all for your time and your willing and whatever you've done in XR, remembering that, you know, for every person who's arrested, we need 10 people behind the scenes, uh, doing social media, fundraising, uh, painting the banners and all that so you know whatever your part is never say I just do this remember that uh, this movement's about all of us and um, everything that we can do lots of lots of love to you all thank you thank you I'm going to hit the end meeting for all so